The Great Cold War brought prosperity to America as the U.S. asked private American companies to bid on contracts instead of projects being run by the government. The competition among these manufacturers kept the American economy healthy. While in Britain there was little choice in awarding contracts since so many industries had been nationalized, and goods and services for the British suffered in quality what was not suffered in price. The government of Britain was in essence hiring itself to do business at taxpayer expense, while the American government was using private corporations competing with each other to keep costs down while maximizing quality, <clears throat> and the British ambassador showed up at the U.S. Treasury Department in August of 1971 with three billion dollars asking for gold that was still fixed at thirty-five dollars an ounce since the days of FDR. <clears throat> so President Nixon closed the gold window in his face. Nixon froze wages and prices for 90 days to successfully weaken the dollar, and that made imported goods more expensive, and those dollars in the British ambassador's hands were suddenly worth less than what he'd paid for them, and he was forced to go back to London to refinance himself. The month after the Americans had landed on the beaches of Normandy, a meeting at Bretton Woods in July of 1944 had created an international monetary fund and an international bank. And the next month they met at Dumbarton Oats, Oaks <coughs> to talk about creating the United Nations, whose intentions were better than the quality of humans that would participate in the institution of the UN. And to counter the plans for the IMF and the UN, the British had devised an institution of their own based on the 1941 Atlantic Charter that the British would call NATO. The Bretton Woods Agreement in July of 1944 had fixed the currency exchange, and when Nixon closed the gold window to float exchange rates in August of 1971, he turned his back on Bretton Woods just as surely as George Washington had crossed the Delaware and OPEC met in Vienna in 1973 because the oil producers needed more money to keep up interest payments to their respective financiers. The British had helped OPEC organize, but were unable to control them because the Arabs liked Arm and Hammer better than they liked the British. And OPEC well remembered that Lawrence of Arabia had been sent to organize the Arab tribes against the Turks in the Great War, and then had not been given their promised Arab state that Lawrence said they would be given as a reward for helping to get rid of the Turks. And instead they'd gotten the sykes pico Agreement dividing the Middle East between France and Britain. And they were also given the foreign puppet Faisal on the throne in Iraq. The bigger problem for the Arabs was that Aden, Aden, Aden had been a British headquarters, and Oman and Yemen and Aden had been buying weapons from Russia and China. And so Armin continued to look for oil in other parts of the world, such as the South China Sea, Pakistan, Peru, Colombia, and the North Sea. And the Libyans were given less foreign investment than they could have had before Qaddafi's Islamic revolution. Although this attempt failed to win higher prices, it should have provided a little memento mori for the sisters, reminding them that their vast commercial empires were created on the shifting sands of increasing Arab nationalism and militancy. The cloud on the horizon, no bigger than an oil minister's hand, was a forthcoming storm that would spread from the desert all over the world. The first critical showdown over oil control came in Libya. By this time an OPEC member, in 1969, in the late 1960s, Libya had leaped to stardom in the world supply scene. Its oil was of high quality, and it was very close to major West European markets whose oil-thirsty economies were just a short hop across the Mediterranean. By 1969, Libya was supplying one-quarter of total European needs. In 
Then suddenly a coup in the country. Canadian Oil, page 23. OPEC sprung an oil embargo in October 1973 for five months, claiming there was a rumor that America with would withdraw from Vietnam and give the Southeast Asian oil market to the communists, and that would drive down the price. And OPEC raised the price of oil 400% and created the energy crisis by cutting off the supply. And that also raised the price for the Seven Sisters. And Britain threatened to nationalize the North Sea oil wells in 1974 when the taxes were already high enough to cut their business off at the knees. Armand would meet Prince Charles at a garden party in May of 1977 and was asked if Britain could ever be self-sufficient in oil. And Armand told the prince that Britain could achieve not only that, but also could become an exporter, so the prince went to visit the North Sea Wells in February of 1978. Are they paying you well? I heard him ask one man. Oh, very well, sir, he answered, but the trouble is that we lose 50% of it in taxes. Hammer, page 394. The seven sisters in 1974 were Exxon, Texaco, Mobil, SoCal, Standard of California, and Gulf, and the two foreign sisters were BP, British Petroleum, formerly Anglo-Iranian, and Shell, Royal Dutch slash British Shell, and Exxon was number one in America and BP was number one outside of America. And at the beginning of 1974, the price of oil was four times higher than it had been at the end of the previous summer, and American corporations were bound by antitrust laws while foreign corporations were not. The fight is dominated by Standard Oil and Shell, and their worldwide duel has transformed deserts, created cities, and modernized countries in the last ten years, mainly because of its large share of the markets of Asia and Europe. Shell has been catching up on Standard Oil, and in the next ten years may well overtake it. Shell men insist that they provide a necessary buffer between producer and consumer countries, that the alternative to the orderly squabble of the seven sisters is a hopeless free-for-all of two hundred sisters, scratching one another's eyes out, never secure enough to make long-term investments, and possibly leading to an international crisis with the Russians. Undoubtedly, Shell and the other six face a difficult future with an oversupply of oil, a surge of economic nationalism, and Russia undercutting prices. Anatomy of Britain, page 436-8. to eight. The Shah of Iran did very well for himself for the next quarter century after the Mossadegh troubles. Since he didn't have to worry about Russia thanks to his big win at the UN in 1946, where Russia traded their presence in Iran for Israel being granted a state of their own. The Shah sold much more than oil to the Western world because Muslim Arabs had brought poppies with them when they conquered Iran, and the poppy did very well in Iran's climate, and Iran became one of the world's largest exporters of opium, directly competing with the British poppy plantations in India. Muslims forbade alcohol but allowed the use of opium. And when Hitler's war was interfering with exports, Iran had been flooded with its own product and addiction in Iran rose dramatically. The Shah, the Shah banned po growing poppies. The Shah banned growing poppies in 1955, but smugglers brought it in from Afghanistan and Turkey, and the smugglers brought more than more crime than the Shah could handle, and too many Iranian police were being killed, so the Shah made opium legal again after 13 years and tried to control it with licensing, but the black market had taken over and was now unstoppable. The Shah sent gunboats up the Tigris River in Iraq in 1970 to demand an end to the boatloads of opium coming through Iraq from Turkey, but his show of force was simply ignored, and Iraq accused Iran of assisting the Kurds, so Iran in turn claimed to own Bahrain, but the UN had declared Bahrain independent in 1968. The British had once been the ruler of the seas, but now, but had now become the master of the airwaves. 
and they had taken control of newspapers and radio and television. And when the group of sheiks that banded together from six Arab states to create OPEC made Abu Dhabi their capital in 1971, Bahrain and Qatar refused to join because the British newspapers had told them that the Jews wanted their greater Israel back, not just the small sliver held by the state of Israel, but the whole territory between the Nile and the Euphrates rivers. The Arabs had failed to push the Jews into the sea in the Six-Day War, and the British suggested that the Arabs could pay them to help finish the job and to kick it off. The British encouraged Iraq to claim that it owned Basra in 1972, as well as the two islands opposite the port of Mkasser. Mkasser and they promised the Arabs military assistance for the venture. But Iran, Iran said that those islands were theirs, and Iran warned the British not to use the two islands as a military base. Kuwait had been a disputed province during the Ottoman Ep Empire, and Gulbenkian had given it to the British. And the problem for the British had been getting Muslims to unite and OPEC had come close, but Muslims were more interested in fighting with each other, especially Sunni versus Shiite, and the elusive goal of getting the entire Islamic world to unite against the state of Israel would remain a pipe dream. Had the Muslims ever stopped fighting each other long enough to attack Israel, the Americans would surely come to their rescue, and then there would be hell to pay. So instead, the Sunnis and the Shiites took turns befriending America in order to bring each other down. And when all the Arab countries surrounding the state of Israel had attacked in 1967, the British reminded the U.S. that the 20-year-old Aramco Agreement implied a rollover clause in regard to Iran and that the U.S. was bound by the U.N. rules to send over the American army to defend the oil wells in Iran. If America had sent in the Marines, all the Muslims in Arabia would certainly gather for the final battle. But the Shiites in Iran were not interested in fighting the Americans, and only wanted to watch their Sunni enemies fall on their own swords. So the Americans stayed home and told the British that the situation in Vietnam suspended all peacetime contracts now that the U.S. was at war in Vietnam. The Suez Canal was being used to ship Saudi oil, and Britain promised to withdraw east of the Suez Canal the day after Bobby Kennedy was murdered on D-Day in 1968, and they would be completely out by 1971, and America was left to provide all the security in Egypt and Arabia. The Saudis and the Iranians mostly policed themselves, and America sold arms to both sides so they could keep out the British as well as keeping out the Russians. And Egypt attacked Israel again in October of 1973 for the Yom Kippur War. The Shah of Iran sided with OPEC in 1973. Despite being friends with America, <clears throat> and the price of oil tripled when the Arabs cut back on production to protest the Americans selling arms to Israel. The Muslims were not strangers to bloodshed, <clears throat> and almost a million Ottomans had been killed during the Great War, while the Muslim Ottomans had killed almost two million people living under their rule. Over one million Italians had been killed, and four million Austrians and Germans had been killed, and five million French and Russians had been killed, and it had cost the British crown over 13 billion pounds to kill them. And after the Great War, Turkey, Iraq, and Arabia were administered by the British without a shred of reward for those who had been led by Lawrence of Arabia and his impossible promise that they would be giving, given an Islamic state of their own if they won for Britain the battle against the Turks in the Holy Land. Many Muslims found fellow travelers in the Jew communists who had escaped Hitler and come to America. <clears throat> 
and these two communists were wont to echo the Moslems' drumbeat against the state of Israel, simply as a backlash of spite against what was no longer the hope of Jews in Germany, that their adherence to Mosaic law would be recognized and rewarded by German people of goodwill, and to those forced out of Germany in the thirties, a happy Jew was now a foolish Jew. Some turned their focus to uplifting what they perceived to be the downtrodden in America, specifically women and blacks, in hopes of pleasing the God who had just allowed one-third of them to be murdered under the Nazi flag, and they diverted their Judaistic beliefs into civil rights legislation, and they fomented civil disobedience against an established culture they blamed for having allowed Hitler to steamroll over their former homeland. Jews in the broadcast industry took up the banner of victimhood and set their face, faces against the bulwark of Christianity in America, that same culture that had denied them a place in Hitler's Germany. And during the campaign for president in 1960, the television news left Nixon without makeup and put lighting against him that made him look pale and sickly while JFK appeared healthy and robust when the truth was actually the opposite and people who listened to the debate on the radio were convinced that Nixon had won the debate. Election fraud in Texas and Chicago won the day for the Democrats now bent on spreading a revolution of sex, drugs, and rock and roll throughout America with the primary purpose of poisoning the righteous Christians who had not acted swiftly enough to save the lives of the European Jews during Hitler's war. The new plan for the Great Society would be that the federal government would pay each state to set up welfare agencies, money that was based on the number of people eligible for that welfare, so the states tried to get as many people as possible to sign up, and then when the states were required to pay most of the money doled out, the actual amount of welfare received by people was quite small. The Democrats wanted to pass a, quote, new Bill of Rights, close quote, after Hitler's war, that would guarantee everyone access to food, shelter, and employment, and they told Americans that it would stave off the rising tide of communism by supplying the needs of everyday Americans, but they failed to mention that this was communism. The civil rights legislation intended to undercut the power of private religious charity, passing that work on to the non-Christian government of state where the Christian Bible would not be included in handouts to the poor. The Democrats said that an American with a full belly and a place to lay their head would be less likely to pick up a red flag, but the Republicans thought that giving that much of a helping hand would make poor people not only lose their dignity if they accepted such handouts, but would rob them of the incentive to find a job, and being on the dole would turn them into communists who would sit around not working like the Russians were doing now that their border was secure. The Jew communists spearheading the Great Society welfare state had been very impressed that communism had beaten Hitler and his unbeatable Germans, and the Democrats insisted on their Great Society mainly because it would guarantee Democrat votes for generations to come, as well as employing countless Democrats in the government jobs needed to maintain their welfare state. Because Ike was elected before the 60s were cranked up to full speed, instead of the Democrat plan, America got the Republican GI Bill of Rights, and the GI Bill put most of the government's available money towards military projects and veterans' affairs and other industries that served people who had been in the armed forces. The GI Bill financed military-style housing and paid for military-type health care, and the economy turned towards soldierly things and regular order. And while some wanted an American Beverage Act to guarantee a job as a fundamental right, just like in England and in Russia, the Americans toned it down into the Employment Act of 1946, a promise that the government would do what it could to help unemployment, but without interfering in private business. America boomed, while socialist Europe stagnated, and if it weren't for the Marshall Plan, Europe would have taken much longer to emerge from having been bombed back into the Stone Age. 
In America, President Ike convinced the U.S. Congress that America needed an interstate highway just like Germany's Autobahn that had afforded a smooth ride all the way from Frankfurt to Hanover, and Ike sold it to the American taxpayer as a military necessity after having gone all those many miles crunching roadless through Europe. After Hitler's war, the French de Gaulle signed the Treaty of Dunkirk with Britain in March of 1947 that was an alliance between them, promising assistance to the other if either were attacked by either Germany or by Russia. FDR had created an alternative plan with capital letters, Alternative Plan for Post-War Europe to which Europeans were eager to sign up, and General Marshall used this Organization of European Economic Cooperation, OEEC, that had been planned in advance to administer the Marshall Plan, and the OEEC met in Paris from July to September in 1947. And the Americans wanted to include Russia in the Marshall Plan and had invited Molotov to the meeting in Paris, but Molotov left in disgust when he saw the British chairman and learned that the OEC was being used by Britain as a means of undermining the Soviet Union. Britain was refusing to accept American aid from the Paris OEC and would only accept Marshall Plan loans directly from Washington. And when Marshall announced his intention to include Russia, the British started talking about a Treaty of Brussels instead of the OEEC, and they wanted to create a Western Union defense organization based on the Treaty of Dunkirk, and they got that signed in March of 1948, and it included the creation of a military arm in September, and they appointed Monty as the permanent chairman of the land, naval and air commanders in committee, and Molotov went home to make a plan of his own that would include all the Soviet satellites. The British Brussels Treaty was a military treaty, not just an economic one, and its main purpose was to keep up the price of oil as well as cut Russia out of the petroleum market. Russia was starving and needed gasoline to harvest and deliver food because their collective agricultural system had shut down all the small peasant farms, and Russia was not was also not interested in paying higher prices for oil, but instead Stalin wanted to keep the price low to help the people of the motherland, while countries outside Russia could not resist wanting to buy cheaper oil from Russia rather than paying the higher rate being asked by the British. Mr. Bevan presented his Brussels plan to Parliament in January of 1948, and a month later, Russia moved into Prague to keep the waterway of the Danube open for oil shipments into East Germany. The Bevan plan had been part of the deal the British had tried to make with Hitler, excluding Russia from the oil market, and now that the Russians held half of Germany, the Bevan plan would no longer work and in 1948 the British were threatening a declaration of war against Russia. The French wanted a common European body with a heavy French chairman, but the British were refusing to cooperate with the reconstruction of either France or Germany, and were demanding control of the whole operation for Britain's benefit, including holding sway over what they called British America. Britain was refusing to become a nation among nations, a player among players, a sovereign country among sovereign countries in a democratic capitalistic world. A democratic capitalist world. And as a result, in the decades following Hitler's war, there would be a parade of colonies gaining their independence from the dysfunctional British Empire. In 1948, Britain was telling French National and Shell Oil that the U.S. wanted the OEC to punish Germany, but that was not true. And Bevan told this lie to the world, but what was one more untruth in the vast sea of British lies? The Russians finally had to put up a wall to keep British spies out of 
East Berlin, but many of them managed to sneak past the Berlin Wall into East Berlin anyway, and the Russians started shooting anyone leaving because one out of ten were actual British spies, which was pretty good odds. The British insisted they had a valuable asset to offer the world that they described as, quote, leadership and, quote, ideas. And instead of there being 51 countries, as Marshall had suggested, Britain pushed for a 16 nation members. Britain pushed for 16 nation members served by a handful of officers controllable by Britain. And this was the OEEC that met in Paris in July of 1948 and was signed in September without asking for permission from America about it, violating the terms of the Marshall Plan. The chairman was British, so Truman sent the U.S. Secretary of Commerce to sit in on the board of Britain's revamped OEEC. And Truman told Europe to just work it out, and he made Italy a member of the standing board of the EEC. And Truman also insisted that West Germany be included, but the EEC was actually only represented by Britain, France, Italy, and Belgium. After thinking about the Brussels Treaty for a year, the British came up with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in April of 1949 that was also signed in Brussels, and Britain offered the job of first chief to Ike because they knew he'd be too busy with the Marshall Plan to interfere much with NATO. The new NATO headquarters was at Mons, and Monty moved his assortment of Western Union Defense Organization people from Fontainebleau to Mons to be part of the action, and his previous office at Fontainebleau was where Napoleon had abdicated on the 11th of April in 1814. Ike superseded the British plan with his own version of NATO that was signed in Washington, D.C. in December of 1950, and that NATO had Ike as the supreme commander because Ike wanted NATO to be more than merely a scheme for the British to get control of the oil market, and Ike split NATO into three sections with a Frenchman, an American, and a British leading each, and so Monty was relegated once more to being only Ike's deputy the Treaty of Brussels creating NATO had meant that there would be no atomic energy if NATO had anything to say about it, and the British idea for NATO had been that Britain could ask the U.S. military to defend British oil interests. But the main purpose of NATO for Britain was to make work for the plethora of British military officers left unemployed at the end of Hitler's war. In May of 1952, Ike would give his job to General Matthew Ridgway, who well knew how to keep an eye on Monty, and the Americans hosted the standing board of NATO in Washington, D.C., and Britain pretended they were the same chummy allied command chiefs as Schaefe during Hitler's war, and one of the American representatives was sympathetic to England, but would quickly be replaced in 1953 with a real American, and Ike would personally make an agreement with China at the end of the Korean War in the summer of 1953. While the threat of the Russians was keeping NATO alive, the British bought Russian weapons and smuggled them into North Vietnam, where they had trouble giving them away, because the Vietnamese knew better than to accept gifts from the British, and NATO continued to evolve into a gargantuan money pit. Money pit. The French had scratched out the Plevin Plan in February of 1951, proposing an OEEC military, but England had refused to cooperate and only sent one observer. The British didn't care if the Europeans formed an army, but did not want to join them, preferring instead to imagine themselves a partner of America while the rest of Europe would be tasked to fighting Russia. See Truman's 1955 Memoirs, page 506. The British kept two air forces outside NATO, the SAC and Bomber Command, so they could still call themselves a worldwide power. And the British balked 
at allowing West Germany to rearm and to train with the Americans, but were told that rearming West German Germany would ensure non-reunification. France was refusing to cooperate with Germany in the oil market, which was not true. But that was the line put out in the newspapers, and the truth was that the Muslims in North Africa were rioting, which was giving France grief, and as the deadline approached for British troops to leave Egypt in October of 1955, quote, Israel attacked Egypt with French connivance, close quote. Outlines of English History by George Carter, M.A., London, Wardlock Limited, 1962-1978, page 168. The Treaty of Brussels creating NATO had been signed in March of 1948, and as soon as the British took over NATO the following year, in 1949, the U.S. recognized Red China. Churchill gave his Council of Europe speech in 1950, saying that Germany could only be kept servile if swallowed by a larger whole, and that swallowing included Britain as an overlord chairman, and in response, Truman sent more American troops to Germany in September of 1950 to help the Germans defend themselves from all enemies outside its own borders. According to the Gestapo chief, Churchill's father had, quote, died as the result of rampant syphilis that turned him from an interesting minor politician to a pathetic madman who had to be kept away from the public in the final years of his life, close quote, Gestapo chief, page 180 and 81. According to rumor, Churchill hated Americans because his father had married one, and young Winston blamed her for his father's having contracted contracted syphilis, and his father had said young Churchill was only fit for the army because the only thing he'd done as a child was play with his toy soldiers. Because rich Americans and industry leaders had rallied, rallied behind the war effort to fight Hitler's National Socialism, They'd been able to bring all Americans along together in devoted patriotism despite the difficulty and the carnage and the danger, and America emerged from Hitler's war with economic flags flying. The American GI Bill made money available for schooling and housing and industrial projects for its citizens, and after both world wars, America held all the IOUs. The winter of 1946-47 had been the worst of the 20th century, and the River Thames froze solid at Windsor. And King Saud sided with the U.S. against the British and their Hashemite friends in Jordan. And the Saudis kept the American economy vibrant as the price of oil was pegged to the petrodollar. And the Saudis kept the U.S. Treasury solvent by loaning or borrowing enough money to keep America going and it was nice to have friends in the oil market. When the dollar fell, Europe could buy cheaper oil, and when the dollar was strong, Europe needed to pay more. And when Europe had to borrow money to meet its government payroll, the bank with the lowest interest rates was asked for a loan, and if Europe borrowed a billion dollars in 1960 and paid it back ten years later in 1970, dollars worth more than the dollars they borrowed, Europe would lose its shirt on the deal. If Europe lent America a billion dollars for ten years by buying U.S. Treasury bonds in 1960, and the value of the dollar fell, the U.S. would pay Europe back in 1970 with dollars worth almost half what was lent, and Europe would again lose out. The idea of oil scarcity boosted the petrodollar, even though petroleum actually was rock oil that was a natural byproduct of ongoing geologic processes, and not at all made out of ancient dinosaurs and ancient foliage, according to the quote-unquote fossil fuel theory. And after Nixon went off the gold standard in 1971, the dollar was backed only by faith in the U.S. government. The Nixon shock ended Bretton Woods, and to bring back Bretton Woods, the British had to get rid of Nixon. <clears throat> when Nixon had been elected, he made friends with Russia and China, 
and that meant school children could stop having to hide under their desks for atomic bomb drills, and Nixon imposed price controls in 1973 and started the EPA and OSHA and the EEOC, and he created quasi-judicial bodies to handle the landslide of lawsuits backlogged from the 1946 Administrative Procedures Act. <clears throat> The APA had allowed skilled lawyers, especially in labor unions, to stop corrupted agencies from interfering with the productivity of the working man. But more importantly, it kept the unions and regulatory agencies independent from the government by giving them the right to sue in open court over just grievances, and so the APA cured the corruption of government bodies that no longer served those who those they were designed to serve, but had evolved into agencies that only benefited themselves. Once these branch agencies had entrenched themselves as part of the money flow of regular business, it was impossible to keep them honest or to remove them, because neither Congress nor the executive branch were equipped to take on what had become, in essence, a plethora of new branches of government having sprung to life out of the New Deal. Yet if lawyers from the APA were available at no cost to pursue individual claims against those agencies, the structure would be adequately policed and both sides would benefit the unions or the companies on the one hand and the regulatory agencies on the other. If the government was not only the employer but was also the court, Labor unions could only threaten strikes and violence, which was what was going on as often as possible in Britain. So Nixon had accomplished a great thing with the upgrade of the Administrative Procedures Act. In 1974, Nixon broke up Ma Bell <clears throat> with antitrust laws while the British were fighting for control of the Suez Canal. And for his second term, Nixon won 18 million votes and carried 49 states in 1972, sweeping the Electoral College with the exception of Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. And within a few years, the news media would paint him as a criminal and a traitor after convincing the voters that a Democrat Congress was needed to quote-unquote balance the American government. The difference between the impeachment of Nixon... <clears throat> and the attempt to impeach Trump in 2019 would be that the Internet in 2019 gave History Anonymous a decent chance, rather than the news media coming from a single source as it was during the Nixon years. And the closing statement of Chairman Schiff on the 19th of November in, night in 2019 would be the greatest clowns in America show because somebody must have told Adam Schiff to inject a little emotion into his performance because he was losing his audience, but we were already in pain from laughing ourselves sick over Fartgate that had broken the night before. The day after Fartgate, NBC News would post a video interview of Bernie Sanders demanding that pharmaceutical companies be held criminally liable for the opiate epidemic in America and that Medicare for All foist the government's idea of addiction treatment upon us while everyone had to cough up a $200 per month copay for drugs. Nixon had run with Ike in 1952 and served eight years as his vice president, and Ike had been the first Republican to win the presidency since Herbert Hoover in 1928. And the voters had chosen a Democrat after Hoover because the newspapers blamed the great crash on greedy capitalists rather than on all the common folk who had been borrowing money to play the stock market. After seeing the effects of socialism in Europe under Hitler, Americans embraced capital capitalism again and ran with it to everybody's benefit, and Ike ran on a Republican ticket, even though he was a Democrat at heart, just like Donald Trump. People were surprised that the British voted Churchill out of office in exchange for a socialist, but there had been much to be surprised about with America's brothers across the sea. 
unbreakably bonded by a common language, and while it was no secret that Churchill had lost a fortune in the great crash of 1929, it was also no secret that Churchill was not actually descended from the great Marlborough Churchill, but it didn't matter because he thought he was, and many aspiring historians were willing to back him up on that claim. At the beginning of the Great War, Churchill had taken a brigade to Holland where the French had been supposed to meet him, but the French had failed to show because they were busy fighting Germans, and Churchill's brigade was ordered to fall back, but were cut off by the enemy, and fifty-seven of his men died, with three times that many wounded. Churchill's brigade surrendered and spent the rest of the war interned in Germany while Churchill stayed in Belgium and spent the remainder of the war familiarizing himself with the terrain around Caen and Calais, and Churchill kept a bronze bust of Napoleon on his desk. On Sunday night, the 26th of February, he slipped out of harbor in his brig. Within eighteen days of his landing, Napoleon was installed in the capital. Wellington recommended the immediate transport of an army to the Netherlands. The King of Great Britain was still King of Hanover. Hanoverian troops meant to take the offensive. During the early days of June, tension was heightening. Quietly on June 15, Napoleon struck at the hinge of the Allied armies. The capture of Brussels would be a great forward stride. Possession of a capital city was always a lure for him and a source of strength. Napoleon had in mind the vision of a shattered British army grimly awaiting transports for home in the Flemish ports. He ordered Nia to attack and then meet him that evening in Brussels. By nightfall, Nia had not gained his objective. Brussels was not in his grasp. Marshal Blücher was outgeneraled, his army split in two, battered by the magnificent French art artillery, and driven back. Napoleon decided in the small hours of the 17th to send Marshal Grouchet with 33,000 men to pursue the Prussians while he flung his main weight against Wellington. The crisis of the campaign was at hand. There seems no doubt that in the opening days Wellington had been surprised. As he confessed at the time, Napoleon's movements had quote-unquote humbugged him. But immediately after the battle, his methodical mind was in full command of the situation. Wellington himself had inspected this Belgian countryside in the autumn of 1814. He had noted the advantages of the ridge at Waterloo. So had the great Duke of Marlborough a century earlier. Throughout the night of the 16th and 17th, a carefully screened retreat began, and by morning the Waterloo position, a line of defense such as Wellington had already tested in the peninsula was occupied. Upon the French must be forced the onus of a frontal attack. Napoleon, furious to hear of Wellington's skillful withdrawal, pounded in his carriage down the Brussels road with his advance guard in a desperate attempt to entrap the British rear. The mercy of a violent storm slowed up progress. An angry scene took place upon the meeting of Napoleon and Nia, who was greeted with the words from the Emperor, "'You have ruined France!' Churchill's History, page 400 to 402. Wellington had been saved in the peninsula when his Jewish banker made gold available from Frankfurt <clears throat> to pay off the enemy. And it had taken Napoleon 100 days to get to Waterloo, so it was no surprise that Market Garden had been slated for the 17th of September in 1944 that was exactly 100 days after D-Day. The city of Charleroi in Belgium had been named after Charles II of Spain, and when he had died childless, the War of the Spanish Succession fired off from 19, 1701 to 1714 and the fight had been over the port of Antwerp, and it had ended with the establishment of the British House of Hanover. Marlborough Churchill had wanted to withdraw completely from the Spanish Netherlands halfway through the war in 1706, taking his British troops instead over to Italy, but the Dutch had refused the plan. 
Marlborough Churchill's loyalty had always been in question after his betrayal of his monarch, James II. And Marlborough Churchill had been replaced before the Battle of Denian in July of 1712 because the British needed someone they could trust to obey orders. The War of the Spanish Succession had dragged on until the French gathered 200,000 soldiers to the battlefield in May of 1712, and the British commander who had replaced Marlborough was told to stand down so his Dutch and Austrian allies would be left to the mercy of the French during the Battle of Denain. Just inside the French border, Denain was between Tournai and Mons, and in the Battle of Denain that July of 1712, the French had trapped the Dutch on the wrong side of a river, and they blew all the bridges and killed thousands and captured the Dutch commander, and when the Dutch tried to cross another bridge, it also collapsed as they were crossing, and hundreds of Dutchmen drowned. The Battle of Denain was a major turning point in the war ending with the Treaty of Utrecht that forced everyone to recognize the House of Hanover. And while the Dutch were drowning and the Austrians were being slaughtered, the British made a separate peace with France behind the backs of their allies. The War of the Spanish Succession had seen Austria and France fighting over Trieste because France had been gaining too much power in northern Italy that was allowing them to blockade the Austrians sailing in and out of the lovely port of Trieste. The Treaty of Utrecht took Silesia away from the Austrian Catholics and gave it to the Protestant Prussians, and the British claimed to have stood down from the Battle of Denain because they needed to march to Dunkirk to hold it for Britain, rather than helping their allies. In order to cover up that betrayal, George I would have Marlborough Churchill's replacement commander put on trial and had his estates and titles taken away, and that commander would move to Spain to help with a plot to put the great pretender back on the British throne. The House of Hanover had originally come from the line of the Bernards who had ruled in Hanover since the 14th century, and the primary purpose of giving George I of Hanover the crown of Britain 300 years later in 1714 was to exclude Catholics from the English throne forever. Hanover had been partitioned in 1375 between three brothers and Bernard I was given Lüneburg, a territory encompassing over 4,000 square miles, and Monty was descended from and named after that original line of Bernard I of Lüneburg, and the Bernard who had been oh, the Bernard who had been one of the three sons of Duke Magnus who had rolled, ruled in Hanover in 1367. Bernards reigned from their home in Lüneburg until the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I made the Duke of Hanover an elector of the Holy Roman Empire in 1692, and with George I and his House of Hanover, the Duchy of Lüneburg became not only part of the United Kingdom, but also remained in the Holy Roman Empire from 1714 to 1837, when Victoria became the Queen of England, and under Queen Victoria, Hanover could no longer be part of the Holy Roman Empire because no female was allowed to be the Holy Roman Emperor. Instead, Hanover became its own kingdom so they could stay a member of the Holy Roman Empire, and the Kingdom of Hanover lasted until 1866, when it was given to Prussia. The strange thing about Hanover was that it was legally bound to be indivis indivisible, so it could not be split up among any heirs, heirs, heirs and its succession was to follow male primogeniture, and that meant that Monty was fighting for his own personal claim to Hanover, not just for the land, but for an actual claim to being the lawful Holy Roman Emperor. And if Britain could make a separate peace with Hitler and turn around to help Germany defeat the Russians, then Monty would have won back both his ancestral lands as well as his title, at which point Bernard Law Montgomery, 
would actually have been in the running with Hitler to become the Holy Roman Emperor, and it would have been difficult to find a more qualified candidate than Monty, because Hitler was, after all, just a commoner 